All right. Good evening. Welcome to the first meeting for the month of April. And uh, I'd just like to thank everyone for being here. We have a full house tonight, so just remember to treat everyone with respect. And, of course, uh, maintain your composure. And uh, I'll ask the city manager to give his report. Yes. The first thing I'd like to address is there's been a lot of social media today about budget uh, that was possibly going to be on the agenda. There is no budget on the agenda. I, as the acting city manager, prepare the budget along with the city controller or deputy controller, and it's not done. It's not close to done. So there re we really are not in a position to answer questions or discuss the budget. The budget's due to the council on the 10th. It will be delivered on time and then released to the public on the 20th. So anyone that came out to talk about the budget tonight, I am sorry that you got bad information, but I would recommend that anyone that reads something and is planning on coming to a council meeting, go to our website, and you can actually pull up the agenda, and you'll see what's on it and what's not on it. Uh, that being said, every year around this time of year, we get uh, a lot of uh, concerns when people see seals on the beach. Seals belong on the beach. That's something that they do. That's where they rest. That's where they sun themselves. We deal all the time with uh, the Marine Mammal Protection Act and with Okeanos out east. And all I will tell you is stay away from them. They can actually bite your hand right off. They do attack if, if approached. So the seals are all fine. If there is an issue, we take care of it right away. And we know the difference between a seal sunning and a, a seal in distress. Um, the Long Island Commission, of Commission for Aquifer Protection has selected the Long Beach community to participate in a smart sprinkler system lottery. LICAP will be giving away a limited number of free smart irrigation controllers and providing rebates for up to $250 for installation. The way these work, the traditional sprinkler system works on a timer or a clock. So every day between 5 a.m. and 7 a.m., they'll put on your sprinkler. This controller actually takes into account weather. So if we had a day like today, your sprinkler wouldn't go on because it would read the soil and stuff to know that uh, it, it's not necessary. We will be host the city will be hosting a spring break job fair tomorrow, April 4th, from 2 to 5 at the MLK Center. To apply for summer jobs, please be sure to bring photo ID, social security, health insurance card, and working papers for those uh, under 18. This Thursday, April 5th, at s from 6 to 8, at United Healthcare Offices in Hempstead, the Long Island Housing Services will be hosting a forum on fair housing. Discussed at this meeting will be how to avoid housing discrimination and your rights and obligations as landlords or tenants. For more information, visit longislandfairhousing.org. Uh, we are part of the Estuary Reserve Council, and they had a meeting. Uh, their next meeting will be April 11th at the town of uh, Hempstead Department of Conservation, Conservation and Waterways in Point Lookout, and you can visit the city's website to view the tentative agenda. As a reminder, phase one of the fully federally funded Army Corps of Engineers Beach Projection Project is complete. A contract is expected to be awarded next this month for phase two. The Army Corps and the DEC will be hosting a meeting on April 18th at 7 p.m. to discuss the project's next step. The city will be hosting Earth Day in Kennedy Plaza, powered by PSE&G Long Island, on April 22nd. Also that day, the Jellyfish Jamboree Parade will be taking place on the boardwalk at 11.30 a.m. All participants, participants in the parade will receive a sand dollar that will be good for discounts at local restaurants and businesses. All applications for the parade must be submitted by April 15th. For more information, visit longbeachny.gov slash earthday. And finally, we are all, all are invited to join an evening of poetry with Nassau County Poet Laureate Peter V. Dugan featuring the Barrier Islands homegrown poet, Long Beach native Harry, Harold Michaelman. The event will take place at Starbucks, 101 West Park Avenue, on April 27th at 7 p.m. All right. Our first item this evening is a public hearing for a resolution granting waiver of Wall Street parking requirements for premise 68 West Park Avenue for a tobacco vape convenience store. Good evening. Long Beach, New York. I'm the attorney for Long Beach Smoke uh, Inc. I have with me uh, my client Shobi, Shobi Rangawala. He intends on opening up a uh, convenience store which sells candy, gum, cigarettes, lotto, uh, vape products, hookah products, 
uh, at the premises over here at 68 West Park Avenue. Uh, there will be no vaping or, or hookah, hookah uh, products smoked on the premises. It's all for people to purchase and buy, uh, buy the products uh, that they bu buy there and, and take it to their own place of residence or wherever they feel like using these uh, legal products. Uh, he's very much aware of this, uh, of how this business needs to be run, of the age limits and the requirements for, uh, for people who are buying these type of products. He owns a, a similar store in Oceanside where he's been operating business for six years. Uh, he okay. does not expect an unusually high volume of people. He expects mostly walk in. Maybe some people will stop in and they drive by like they do with any other local business. Uh, but he does not expect anything uh, extraordinarily large as far as volume. Um, uh, he gets, he'll get deliveries by, from UPS and FedEx. He expects some trucks to come in maybe once, uh, once or twice a month or uh, not much more than that. Once, and to once or twice a month from the UPS and no, FedEx? No, he'll get UPS, uh, UPS and FedEx on a regular basis okay. and maybe uh, if he has to have a, a larger delivery where he has a specific uh, truck or company delivering, it might come in a couple of times a month and that's what he's informed me. And how many employees do you anticipate? You, one, one person will probably be running the store. Just one person. Uh, and what will be the hours of operation? 10, 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. Okay. Anyone from the council have any questions? Yes. Hi, good evening. Um, can you just speak to the protocol for the sales of the vaping products as well as the tobacco products? Um, because we have a different... Uh, set of regulations here in the city of Long Beach. So can you just speak to the criteria? How will these items be sold and to whom will they be sold to? Okay, good. I'm going to have my client answer that since he does sell it on a regular basis in Thank Oceanside. You. Good evening. Uh, my name is Rangunwala. They, they used to sell it in Long Beach over the age of 19 before, but I've heard that since March they have changed it to 21. So Oceanside is already 21, so we've been using, I mean, we've been selling it to over 21 years of age of people only. <coughs> so those are the only things. And the store have two levels. So the top level is going to be only for the tobacco products and all those stuff. And the bottom level is going to be just a convenience store. There will be a sign 21 years of age or over cannot, um, I mean, under 21 cannot enter this area. Okay. That's it. Okay. And what, preven uh, what preventative methods will you use to uh, ensure that uh, minors under 21 will not be engaged in this protective area? Well, there will be a sign under 21 not allowed in this area. And if somebody comes in, we would ask them if they are over 21 and they can show their ID before entry. Okay, would anyone from the public care to speak for or against this? This is about the parking variance only. Uh, we are unable to discriminate against a legal business, so this has to do with the parking variance only. Come on up, sir. State your name and address for the record. John McNally, Long Beach. Uh, nothing to do with this particular establishment, but typically when you guys are uh, reviewing a, a variance for off-street parking, we talk about, uh, we probably walk with the owner about a, a bike rack. Um, my suggestion for going forward with that, it's not realistic to assume every single business in the city is going to have a bike rack. Um, I would ask the city to maybe look and reconsider establishing a dedicated fund so if you are awarding uh, a variance for off-street parking, maybe make that contingent upon a $200 donation towards a fund that would improve pedestrian use or bike, you know, bike out, whatever sort of bike resources so that we can purchase the bike racks that we need as a city in bulk, that you could do sidewalk, you know, funding with it or, or you know, any number of sort of variable things that would be a more holistic approach towards addressing that. So, thank you. I, I purposely didn't ask about bike uh, racks for this particular business because it is right, in fact, in the center of the downtown where, as we know, our sidewalks are kind of small. Um, but we have added a bike rack question uh, to the actual form now, and we are streamlining that process to make it a little more uniform for both the businesses and the city at large. Well Thank my you. My client certainly has no objection to a bike rack. There are numerous bike racks uh, on that part of uh, West Park Avenue. 
right yep. in front of City Hall. Anybody can look across the street and see that they're all there are numerous spy tracks there already, and he wouldn't would not object. And to that's one in front that's of why I didn't bring it up because we are a little congested right here in the heart of the city, so uh, we need to take a better look at the whole the whole streetscape. Anyone else for the parking variants? Okay, seeing seeing none. Next item. Uh, the hearing's okay. closed. Okay, on to the regular calendar. Item one is a resolution granting waiver of Wall Street parking requirements for premise 68 West Park Avenue for tobacco vape convenience store. A hearing has been held on this item already. Item two is a resolution authorizing settlement of an action brought by the city of Long Beach against Isla Kagan and Polina Kagan. Yes, a number of years ago, uh, there was an accident on West Broadway where uh, there were witnesses that uh, were placed of the cause of the crash on the Kagan family, and our corporation counsel started litigation. After numerous hear uh, meetings, they settled on a sum of 40000 to be paid to the city, not by the city. Any questions from the council? Any comments or questions from the public? Sure, please come on up. Good evening. Just state your name and address for the record, please. Liz Preston, Long Beach. I'm, I guess this is more for the publicity or something. I'm just curious because I've never seen a lawsuit in the agenda before or uh, geared towards a person doing or is it a special case? Well, uh, there's nothing special about the case per se, Ms. Chester, but this is not the first time where we've had an item on the agenda that's settlement geared and uh, where the city was actually the recipient of the money. It's happened at least one other time during my tenure. So um, we've only received money just one more time. Anytime, anytime there's a settlement over, anytime there's a settlement over $25,000, whether the city is the recipient of the money or whether the city is expending those funds, it must go on the council agenda uh, pursuant to the charter. A donation as well, right? Uh, well, that's, cause that's not under my section of the charter, but yes. But yes, we would have to, to accept the money. Correct. Any other questions or comments from the public? Okay, seeing none, next item. Okay, item three is a resolution authorizing the city manager to enter into an agreement for engineering services for the Long Beach drainage improvements projects and to amend the budget. Um, before we go into this item, uh, there was um, some wording that was left off of this item and the following item. I ask that uh, somebody make a motion at this point uh. to, to add that wording back into the uh, items. Okay, I'll make the motion and the language, and it's a it's uh, larger motion to item both items three and four to, and this is the language that would be added af at the end, and be it further resolved, comma, that the budget modifications set forth in the whereas clauses above are hereby incorporated by reference and adopted in full. And that would be amending, as I said, both items three and item four. The same language at the very end of the item. Do we have a second for this, uh, for this motion? I'll second it. Rolling. Council Member Bendo. Yes. Council Member Randell. Yes. Council Member Moore. Yes. Vice President Dynan. Yes. President Arana. Yes. Okay, item number three is a resolution authorizing the city manager to enter into an agreement for engineering services for the Long Beach. Oh, sorry, I called you the wrong one. Okay. Um, very basically, we found the, uh, well, everyone in town knows the five hot spots or six hot spots that always flood every time we get any rain. And this is um, a plan to remediate those, those hot spots and have proper drainage for uh, all of our streets. I have a, I have a couple questions for the commissioner. For the commissioner.
good evening. Um, Commissioner, in the item, you identify that areas have been, that there are certain areas that have been identified as chronic flood. While most of us know exactly what those areas are, for the rest of us in the public, why don't we just go over what those areas are and when and as part of what study they were identified specifically? Okay, these areas <coughs> were identified by the uh, CRP committee working with New York Rising. This was a, a resident committee, did not have any representation from DPW, but uh, the areas are pretty well known. Uh, it's actually just four areas. One is uh, West Park Avenue running from New York to Nevada. Uh, one is National Boulevard running from West, uh, running from Park down to Broadway, or to the boardwalk. Uh, and one is East uh, Bay Drive. Um, just give me a second. Um, is uh, East Pine between down by the hospital running from uh, Park Avenue down to, uh, to the bay. And the third one is on Riverside Avenue running from Park down to uh, to the uh, Park Place, or which J.J. Evans Boulevard. And when was the study completed? The study was done a year or so after Sandy by the CRP committee. I was not present for it, uh, so I don't have all the details, but this was a project that was assigned to the city uh, through GOSA. And it's fully reimbursable, correct? It's this project is fully reimbursable, and the way the reimbursement r works on the GOSA projects, they are federally funded, uh, so uh, we do not have to bond these projects. One, uh, an invoice is approved either for the, the consulting firm or for the contract that will eventually do the work. They will send us a check. Once that check is deposited in the revenue account, a payment will be made directly to the contractor within five days. So the city will see no expense from this. Which is why we're creating the account, is that correct? Correct. And also, uh, the project is estimated to total to be about $4.4 .4 million dollars and up to 10% of our internal costs will also be covered and reimbursed by GOSA. That would be my time, uh, the Deputy Commissioner's time, or anybody else that works on this project with the engineering firm. So. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I just have a question. Um, I, I know there are multiple uh, proposals uh, sent in, and yeah. because this is an engineering uh, contract, does that mean that it um, you look at the proposals first without looking at the costs? Well, Generally, when we do uh, proposals from engineering firms for ourselves, we look at the proposals first, then we open up the cost. However, because this is a federally funded project, we are not allowed to make a recommendation to GOSA based on the cost. We have to make it based on the best the best proposal. So, Is that for all federal, federally funded? That's for all federally funded projects, and that's actually part of our procurement manual. Oh, okay. Thank you. Could you just discuss a little bit the scope of the work? This, this will be mul multiple types of, the first part will be a, an engineering study, and there'll be multiple types of uh, avenues they'll look at. They'll look at tide vex valves as well as other types of valves. They will look at uh, 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 stormwater uh, chambers that separate sand and grit and cans, and they will also be looking at uh, pipe work, re reconnecting pipe work, and also possible pump stations. And that's what the engineering firm is for. That's the engineering firm will do is they will come back with a series of recommendations in the first part of their study with a design report. We will sit down with GOSA, pick out the things that we think will work best, and then GOSA will look at it and make an approval to proceed. Okay. And then they'll do final design, and once the final design is done, it will go out to bid. Uh, very quick question. <laughs> Commissioner, I jotted down quickly the areas that you described. I just want to clarify, does this also extend to the canals, other areas in the West End, and North Park? No, there, the, there were five areas that were involved, and uh, the canals were by Curl, it was, um, uh, was East Pine by between Curly and uh, Harmon, I believe. But we had done a, a project at that location previously, and that problem on that section has been solved. The things that will solve the, the flooding on the canals will be when we do the, uh, the North Shore bulkhead. Thank you. The, the West End is West Park from New York to Nevada, right? Yeah, the West End will be all the way from New York to Nevada. Right. Probably be some elimination of some of the outfalls, try to go to larger system and a less number of outfalls that will prevent much more uh, high tide water from backing up into the system. 
Anyone else on the council? Anything else? No? Any questions about the engineering services or comments from the public? Just state your name and address for the record. Kevin Riley, Long Beach, New York. Um, I took a look at the, the Dozer website when I saw this pop up on the, on the agenda, and I'm a little confused about are we going to stick to exactly what's in this plan? Because it's it's pretty specific about the, the four spots. Uh, and I guess the, the, the fifth one was removed. So it has the four spots, and then it also calls out approximately um, 50 back fl back backflow prevention devices. So I, I want to know, you know how we come about including lift stations. Can someone talk about that? And is how is this even set up? read further back, part of it calls for the city to do a study on what these are some of their recommendations. doesn't mean we should blindly follow those recommendations. If there's a better way to do it, then we should look at that, and that's part of the study that's in there also. So that's why part of this, the consulting firm is looking at the study also. Well, it's 4.4 million, and then uh, the engineering study is about 400,000. But some of the money, th the CRP projects were a group of projects. It was the OEM center, uh, some housing uh, money. It was a total of 25 million dollars, and also the North Shore bulkhead. Uh, so Goser, in meeting with Goser and going through all the different projects and their requirements for things like locating things in low to moderate income areas, uh, locating some things in, in most need, rearranged that pot of money. So we're spending the same pot of money. We've just moved a little bit more into the North Shore bulkhead and a little less into the, into the uh, drainage projects. And, and that's all done with, the, we've had to have every one of those approved by Gosser. So. Well, <laughs> yeah, just uh, let me, maybe I didn't make myself clear, but each step of the way, we need to get approval from GOSA. So when the design study is done, we're going to give that to GOSA. We're going to sit down with them. We meet with GOSA every week on a conference call. We'll go over the design report, and they will come back with recommendations and things they approve, things they don't approve. We'll go back to the drawing board if there's things they don't approve, and we'll redo it. Uh, before we go out to bid, the project will have full approval by GOSA. Good evening. Just state your name and address for the record. Eileen Hessian. First, I'd like to thank the people who are using the microphone. It's very helpful. Um, my question is about timeline. It sounds like a lot of studies which are necessary. When would the first valve or whatever go in to help the people who are doing the flooding? Would it be years away? How long do you anticipate the study being? We, we, I would hope that by the fall of uh, 2018, we would be starting construction. That's how quickly we want to move this along. Great. Sure, sir. Please state your name and address for the record. Brian McKenna, 60 Armour Street. bulkhead that you're referencing is a big concern of anyone in the canal. Um, two questions. Uh, what's the timeline? What's the budget for it? And when do you expect to start it? The uh, North Shore bu uh, bulkhead project we're concerned about is when the project's going to start in case anybody didn't hear them. Uh, that project will probably be in the fall of 2018 also. 
uh, TetraTech, the design engineer, is moving along. As a matter of fact, in the next uh, week or two, you will see their engineers down in the canal section doing surveying and measuring the, the, uh, the existing bulkhead and doing soil samples. So uh, we hope to also have that contract ready to go out uh, at the same time. These will be two different contractors right. probably doing the work, but uh, there's going to be a lot going on when the fall comes. To be clear, sir, that's a separate project than this budget item. Yes. Yes. It's not this. It's not this. Not this budget item. Correct. The budget for the North Shore bulkhead is uh, twelve and a half million dollars. Right. Okay. Anybody else? I see a hand. Yes. Please state your name and address when you come on up. on the engineering services for this new project. Um, Mary Volosevich, Long Beach. Um, I have a question, Mr. Miranda. You said that um, the tech high flex valves in the canal area, that they were done from Curly to Armour. Am I correct? Okay, um, all right, but some of them have been done, right? Yep. But they're not working. Yeah, we we talked about that at the last meeting. Right. When when are we going to address that? That's what this engineering study is for. It's go it to, to see clean them to, to no to them? see if there's a better way for us moving forward, not just to maintain, but maybe there's a better solution than the tide flex valves, yes, sir. the chambers, right? Okay. Yeah, and just on the tide flex valves that are in already, we have a contract out to bid now for bulkhead work, and in that bulkhead contract. We're including a section for doing tide flex valve maintenance by an outside contractor. They're much better equipped in terms of getting into the, to the valve. So uh, okay. that that should be back sometime in April, and we'll be coming, you know, with a recommendation on that. So uh, that that maintenance is separate from anything that we're doing. Okay. Thank you. Just state your name again, Mr. McNally. John McNally, Long Beach. Um, as I'm sure most of you know, I was a co-chair of the CIP committee that helped formulate this plan. Uh, <coughs> it was a group of residents that put in hundreds of volunteer hours to come up with recommendations for the city. Um, I'm stoked that this is moving forward, first and foremost. Um, but I would, I would just, I guess, ask the commissioner to get some clarity. Uh, Gosar has always said that the committee would remain involved uh, in this process moving forward. Um, and at every step of the way, we've, we've heard nothing. Um, you know, it's a thankless job to begin with. At least one of us is moving on to a, a job even more thankless. Um, I think the rest of you signed up for. Um, but if we can stop calling ourselves a committee, that's great. I got other things to do in my life. But you know, as long as the committee is still together, I haven't been told it's just been disbanded. Um, well, nobody has, but also nobody's telling us anything. So if you could. Okay. Well, we haven't started any work on the drainage project. Uh, when we did do the North Shore bulkhead, every change we made in the North Shore bulkhead, we had a meeting with the CRP committee, uh, and uh, several of the members were there. Everybody was invited. Those that could make it, make it, and then we actually had people from GOSA there to review the changes. This is the first step in the process of the drainage project. Once we have the design report done, we intend to meet with the CRP committee, and uh, so I wouldn't break up yet, and you can see what's, what's in the report then. I mean, I would, so I, I was at the, the bulkhead meeting, and it was, the committee was brought in after the decision w was made, and after, you know, when there was a big stink of the original estimate was X amount, and then all of a sudden we figured out that the engineering report um, was, com or the original estimate was completely off, um, and, you know, deals were made between, you know, what uh, really, I guess, at the state level. So I'm not, this is nothing, right, you know, I mean, but it's just a matter of, so it's, I just want clarity on, what role the committee has moving forward. And, you know, so this was awarded. The committee should be given a notice that this project was awarded. And, you know, we put forward over $300 million worth of projects. So, you know, some common courtesy from the state or whomever that, yeah, the project that you guys, you know, highlighted has been awarded. I, I mean, I, I get emails from the committee saying, what's going on? What are we doing? And I don't have answers. And just that common courtesy is all we're asking for. Okay, and just, just so it's clear to the engineer he's talking about was not an engineering firm hired by the city, okay? That was an engineering firm that was hired by Gosar. 
uh, when we made those changes, those changes were basically dictated to us by GOSA based on the original estimates of the project. So uh, we had to find another way to do things with the limited amount of funds. Uh, as this is the first step, as I said, we would hopefully award the engineering services. Uh, GOSA has already approved it. Uh, and then when they start work, we'll sit down with the CRP committee as they move along and share everything we have. Yeah, yeah I mean, I would just ask for a little bit better communication from GOSA um, or the city, however it flows down. That's all I'm asking. Okay. Thanks. Fair yeah, enough. We, we can be the um, thorns in the side that you guys can't in certain situations, so you know, it could be helpful to have the committee look at it that way. Okay. Thank you, Mr. McNally. Anyone else? About the engineering? This project? Nope. Okay. Seeing none, next item. Item four is a resolution authorizing the city manager to enter into an agreement for construction, administration, and inspection services for the establishment of an office of emergency management for the city of Long Beach and to amend the budget. Okay. New York Rising Community Reconstruction Program identified the need for an OEM to be established within our city. Uh, this is really a very important thing uh, that I was pushing very hard for after Sandy. Uh, it was our OEM became the police commissioner's office, which was not equipped for the number of people that were there, nor to disseminate the information, nor to plan for the recovery. Uh, we've been working on this project for a number of years. The OEM office will actually be in the back of this room, uh, up above us, and uh, this is really, a, a, I think, a, a tremendously positive thing for the city to control our future. describe what an OEM actually is? Yes, an OEM is an Office of Emergency Management. And we're actually looking at a couple of different things for the OEM. Uh, Office of Emergency Management, you declare an emergency and then you staff, or, or in anticipation of an emergency, you staff the OEM. And you staff the OEM with key players that would assist in the recovery. You'd have utilities in the room, you'd have law enforcement, fire department, EMS. So they would make a collective decision if you had to, if you had a major fire, if if you will, at a nursing home. There are so many different logistics that have to be addressed with removing those people and fighting the fire at the same time that you really should have an Office of Emergency Management that can coordinate all the different agencies, bring in all the equipment that you need. The first night after the storm, I was able to get 500 porta potties down here as well as all of the highway lights for the construction on, on Long Island roadways so we lit up our business district that we didn't end up with any broken windows. So. Because we were, had someone over at the Nassau County OEM, we were able to facilitate these. This will make us even more efficient because someone from the Nassau OEM would come to our OEM and relay the information instead of us losing another body. Would, would this OEM just service the city of Long Beach or the whole Barrier Island? Uh, it, it primarily would be the city of Long Beach, but a lot of the things that affect Long Beach, like when we instituted the curfew and the, uh, the checkpoint, the checkpoints were put to the entire Barrier Island. So there are, we do work well together. We have intermunicipal agreements, which we could institute as we move further along into the procedural end of an OEM, uh, but we would work very closely with all the people on the Barrier Island. Okay. And the, the other thing is, when the OEM is not being used, if the city finances improve to such a degree, it would be a perfect opportunity to make what is called a 311 center, which is where people can call in with, with various issues that they have and they get immediate response. So there, there is a, not only for, for horrific instances or emergencies, but also we, we will try to look at a day-to-day -day use of all this equipment. Anything else from the council? If, okay. if I understand correctly, the built, the office would go up on this floor, so this floor would change the layout somewhat? Yes, the, the north side of this uh, ante room would be the OEM on the first floor and the second floor. This wall would come out, I believe, to that first partition, uh, so it would capture more of this room, and it would be a fully functional OEM. Can you speak to any anticipated additional staffing and or costs that are related to this project? The staffing is based on the emergency, so when we have an emergency, uh, I, would, I would be in the OEM, the city manager would be in the OEM, most likely some of the council, and there are no costs associated with us because we're all salaried employees. Uh, that's, that it doesn't have a day-to-day -day cost uh, for that. There will be some costs associated with it when we have to bring in secretaries and people that are unionized and they're entitled to overtime and such. 
But the fortunate thing is, when you open up an OEM, most times you're going to be eligible for reimbursement under uh, federal disaster, uh, uh, New York disaster, local disaster. So there are opportunities. We, we have submitted, just for our snowstorms, we, uh, the governor declared them state of emergencies. We did uh, project tracking of our snow removal, and we submitted a, a, a bill, and we'll see if we get paid for that. So we're getting much more tuned to capturing what happens in an event so that we can look for reimbursement. Any other questions from the council? Just one more question. Um, I'll just follow up to council over there. Would there be recasting of current city staff into the like OEM management type position, or would that be a, a, a new bill of government for these city officials? No, what we did was the actual original grant for the OEM came with money for the director of OEM and an assistant. We used, we're going to be using our fire commissioner, Scott Kemmons, as well as uh, one of our school crossing guards supervisors, Richie Corbett, as the, chair, as the uh, OEM chairperson and deputy. And they did get a stipend, but it was fully funded for, the fir for two years, but we took a little too long to get started. But for the remainder of this year, it will be fully funded through this grant. Any, anything else from the council? No? Any questions about the OEM from the public? Sure, come on up. You state your name and address for the <coughs> record. Good evening, Sam Pinto, Long Beach. A uh, few questions on the OEM. We're, we're putting it on the sixth floor? Yes. yes. Now, question, why are we putting this on the sixth floor of City Hall when historically there's been issues with this building and there's been issues with getting upstairs? I mean, during Sandy, we, the elevators were down, the backup generators were not working. And getting up to the sixth floor, people were practically having heart attacks just to get up here on themselves. Is there any reason why we're doing it here compared to like the second floor of the recreation center, which is, seems more sustainable? Because we can tie in all the existing city services, all of our computer network, we can tie in here. In addition, Cameron Engineering, which is the firm we use to develop this, strongly recommended that as the location. Okay. Um, other question is, this sounds a lot more like an emergency operations center compared to an OEM. Is that really what we're doing, or we're going to be putting an Office of Emergency Management here? Because what you explained before sounds like an EOC, um, is what, which is what you engage during states of emergency or large disaster events. Pretty much they're interchangeable OEMs and o o o in to a certain degree. An OEM is an Office of Emergency Management that you're managing a long-term recovery. The OIC is for the immediacy. But right now, six years after Sandy, uh, we are still dealing with the long-term recovery, which would be part of the OEM. And just one more question. What was, wh how did you guys come to picking the director, assistant directors of this position? Uh, Commissioner Morando organized uh, or put out uh, for resumes. We did interviews, and the selection was made. How many resumes do we know? 50? All right, I, just, I find it a challenge when you're finding people who already have responsibilities within, within the city, especially during a state of emergency, like the building department or the police department, having those people now running those departments or running those responsibilities, also now running the COC, which, or EOEM, whatever you want it to be, um, which historically has been a, a long-term recovery process, not just a one-day thing. So. And as such, there are times where we have to use people in the city to do two jobs. I'm very familiar with that because we have limited personnel. So, understandable. Thank you. Thank you. I just <coughs> want to follow up. When was this search conducted? Only because I'm, I think I'm fairly perceptive and pay attention to a lot of things, and I haven't seen this actual two positions being marketed by the city with job descriptions on the website or anything else like that. So, just wondering. Thank you, Ms. Tristan. Please just state your name again for the record.
Excuse me, Ms. Tresman, do you remember when you came in to interview for the position? I don't recall the exact date. I can tell you that the air conditioning in the building wasn't working at the time. But <laughs> so it was just the summer? <laughs> yes. My so we'll, we'll, go say, we'll go over the summer. <laughs> so, uh, as you know, I have a couple of questions regarding uh, the incident management. Personally, I know way too much about this stuff than I should. Um, but in the in the Ghoster in the Ghoster proposal, the staff is to be paid. So are, is Scott and Rich going to be? I, I just don't understand how they can do both jobs. I mean, I, in s when something happens, you need someone that's an OEM, not the building department fire commissioner. They're all capable, but are they going to be paid in addition to what they're being paid? Because they're two sal it's, you're making it a two position when it was We can have three hundred thousand and three hundred five hundred thousand dollars for two years. Am I not making my sense? I, I don't know if I understand the question. If there was a question, okay. So, it so you've hired Scott and Richie to be partners or senior coach. Will they be paid as OEM? Yes, they will, they will receive a certain uh, financial remuneration for the, the taking on the additional responsibilities, but it will not be the 300000 The 300 they, we took out the stipend that we'd be giving them and repurposed the application to put the money back into the project. Is that so correct, there's John? a new application to go, sir? And how is that, how come it's not on their website? How come you've not been informed? You, you can hold us responsible for our website, but you can't hold us responsible no, for ghosters. But if you've changed something, we should know about it, no? I, I love when people look at me like I'm having <laughs> ten heads. Yes? Um, no? No, uh, it, it, yes? pardon me? Okay. So, so Scott and Rich, Congratulations! Will be the head of the OEM, and they will hire staff, or they will not hire staff. No, they will not hire staff. So uh, how, I don't understand how this will then be a functional OEM. Because when uh, if, if if there is a need for something, they will address it as a case by case basis. Right. But when once Sandy hit, all of us in the, that work for the city were repurposed Correct. to a ton of different jobs. Right. And that actually helped in our overall fiscal recovery. But I'm asking specifically about this Ghoster OEM proposal that came from the DRP. That's what we're talking about because that's what's on the agenda. Yes, yeah, so Rich and, and Scott right now are attending a lot of classes rel relative to OEM and emergency management uh, to bring them up to speed. They came back with a couple of different um, procedures that were best practices, and we're working to implement them. So in between his school crossings and his supervising the others, when he has downtime, he'll be doing this in between, just like my day. Sometimes I'm doing police, sometimes I'm doing city manager, but. So, so uh, I, I, I think I understand. So I, just for clarity, so instead of hiring a full-time OEM uh, director, for three hundred thousand dollars over the course of two years, we would have received as a grant. Then we would have had it as a city fund their salary moving forward. Salary and benefits moving forward. Moving forward. So instead of doing that, we're utilizing the the folks we already have with the talent and the skills, and giving them a small stipend for the additional responsibility. Yes, bo both Scott and Rich have been fire chiefs with the city. They oh no, I'm not questioning their. I'm no, no, we we look long and hard at, at yes. all the applicant all the no, applicants. No, I'm not. That's I'm not questioning that. My question is regarding the Ghoster grant, how it is written. And if, we're, if we've changed it, where is that written that we've changed that? John? And the money that we didn't use, just so that everyone because here heard, the money that we didn't use for salaries went back into the f to fund the actual project? That's correct. We, when we started looking for, first of all, a couple of things. On the OEM office, uh, the 
project includes a generator on the rooftop that's going to supply all the elevators so people will be able to get up and down so we've really looked at all the things we really need in the building to have operating and that generator has been sized for that we were had one hundred fifty thousand a year for two years from ghost of in terms of advertising for the position we were holding off advertising because it did make sense to bring people on we didn't have an o e m yet goes it came to us late and said you know what if you don't use it you're going to lose it so we under their direction we advertise the way they suggest that we advertise they approved all the advertisements we put out the advertiser sub was about three pages long with a lot of good information in there and we advertise in the very various you know employment agencies that they recommend it so we followed all that with the with some of the additions that had to take place for this o e m including some of specialist removal and a handicapped lift to go from the sixth floor to the seventh floor which is going to be a sub floor we had to add that so they allowed us to take the hundred fifty thousand dollars that we weren't going to get anyway and move it into the o e m so we did that so we only had a hundred fifty thousand for this year when we were going through through the through the uh... resumes uh... rich and scott have a long history of emergency management scott has taken numerous causes i've had the opportunity as a fire chief to work with with scott uh... he's more than qualified and having met rich for the first time and going through his resume and the and the interest he has and he's more than qualified this is a way to we wrote back to ghost and said what we'd like to do is this is not really a full-time position we will not have money going forward for it we'd like to assign it to an existing commissioner and give him an l d r m or a local disaster recovery manager to work with him during those events and quite frankly during all these events a lot of this work gets done in the d p w office by by our staff so in terms of recovering funds okay i hope that answers the question i'm sorry say it again you change if we change and go to change the contract where is that Go, sir. We have that contract, and we actually advertised when we made that change. If you want to foil it, we'll get you a copy of it. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions or comments from the public about the OEM? Yes, come on up, sir. Please state your name and address for the record. Uh, Frank McQuaid, 573 Magnolia Boulevard. Does uh, this provision uh, vest any legal authority ex officio to anyone assigned to uh, the office, uh, allowing them to uh, compel through a legal authority uh, participants to uh, perform? presuming that they're not police uh, officers. This item is just related to the retention of an engineering firm. That's it. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions or comments about the engineering firm for the OEM? Yes. Good evening. State your name and address for the record. How are you? My name is Brittany Littlejohn, and I live in Long Beach, New York. Um, I just have a few questions about this OEM. I'm talking about, like, aren't all of these organizations somewhere in this building already? Like, the police department's, like, right there. Fire department's right there. Sanitation's right there. Like, why are we making, like, another one? And then on top of it, doesn't Nassau County already have one of these that we can just, like, tap into? Like, I could, we could set up a group chat. Like, sounds like a lot for nothing. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, no, you're woefully understating the importance of this. During Sandy, as I said earlier, mm -hmm. we set up my office in the police department mm -hmm. as the OEM that has housed the city managers, Department of Public Works, the police department, the fire department. City council came in to get briefed on that. I also had to meet with the governor and the United States senators from our state during these processes. Mm -hmm. There was no privacy. So when, some, when, when something bad happens, you need to have a dedicated place where you can have clear minds, uh, prepare for and, and organize the recovery. 
and this is Rockville Center has an OEM. We are going to have an OEM. Nassau County has an OEM, and I don't know all of the OEMs, but there are way more than, than that. We actually were going to partnership with Rockville Center at one point. Okay. I'm just saying, like, because it seems like everything's, like, centered around this building, I mean, on this block, and to make some, like, a pretty much like a microcosm of that whole block on this floor just seems a little redundant. Just that's how it came across to me. I don't, I'll communicate with you via email, but just saying. Just a few no. quick ones. And just to the second part of your question was, Nassau County has an OEM. Why is it beneficial for us to have OEM and not the OEM? The question was, and for the second part of your question, mm -hmm. Nassau County has its own OEM. Why are we not using their OEM as opposed to building our own yeah. as a gaming facility? Because there are decisions that have to be made locally. A perfect example of needing our own, uh, our own OEM. As Sandy progressed, mm -hmm. uh, we ended up moving into the public works because we were able to get a generator to power the whole building. When we moved into public works, that gave us enough space to adequately work. But at one point, we had to kick everyone out of the space and just bring in PSE and G so we could re-energize the overhead lines to give power because we were without power for almost three weeks. We would have been out without power if we had taken the Suffolk approach, which gets, means a licensed engineer goes into every home, and that's what Nassau County wants to do, send a, licen a licensed electrical engineer to every home to determine whether or not it was the safe to put on the electric. We worked with PSE and G to do it safely and do it in um, blocks at a time, but because we had the ability to have that space for it. When the storm was ongoing in the very early stages, we actually sent people up to, to be at the Nassau County OEM, and we competed for resources with the, with the rest of the South Shore. We won't be competing with resources. We'll be going directly to the state with our own OEM. Okay. Fair enough. There is a lot of thought that has gone into this. Oh, I'm, I'm sure there is. I'm not questioning that. All right. Thank you. No, thank you. I'm sure, like myself, it's all new to us. Uh, just one additional question. Uh, the, the grant covers the physical structure. Of the Hi. Sorry, sorry. The grant covers the physical structure, construction, administration. The equipping of the OEM, would that be done under a separate grant, or is that somehow included in this? Because obviously equipping is not going to be cheap. Yes. Uh, it was whether, whether or not the equipment is going to be included. The equipment, right down to the laptops, to the chairs, to the, to the tables, to the cabinets, are all part of the project. Of this one? Yes. Not the... Okay, this is the design stage. <laughs> right. So we're, we're going far afield into the actual OEM, but th it will be the design stage does have all of the type of equipment so that it would fit in the spaces provided. Any other comments about the design of the new OEM? Yes. Please state your name and address for the record. Nora Egan, uh, Long Beach. Um, just a quick question. If the comprehensive plans then city council moves to stop and shop, right? So are we going to spend money on an OEM here and then move it there? Or has this been like thought about? For the last 30 years, I've been told the soapbox is going to be developed. We can't wait to see if we that's ever going to happen. Okay. I'm just because there's a meeting like next week about it. So just. Has it been thought about, put into consideration to whoever is going to build this office? I haven't given it any consideration. Um, in my mind, the most expedient thing to do was to build our own, and if that ever does come to fruition, we'll deal with it at the time. All the equipment will be movable. Uh, the space will have to be rebuilt, so the, the entire city hall will have to be rebuilt. So at the time we do those plans, we can make modifications. We're not going to lose the equipment. Or we're going to lose money by building something here. We won't lose to anything. eventually the move it there. Money. The state, I pay state taxes. Everybody here does. So we're going to lose money anyway. So is there any thought being put into it that we could use space that we already have somewhere, whether it be like City Hall or some floor here that's not being utilized, just so that we don't waste money because 
we don't have an awful lot of money to spend in Long Beach. No, we certainly don't. So um, I think it should be something that should be thought about what instead of like maybe wasting the state's money on a building that we bring it to them that we don't have the money to spend on a new office. So we use something in the earned term and just make do. Well, as I said earlier, this process has been going on for years. I when understand that, but like what we're going through right now is we have no money. So it's up to you, and I'm sorry, you're our interim city manager, so it's up to you to bring it, to bring my voice and tell them, we don't have the money as a Long Beach taxpayer, as a New York State taxpayer, we don't have the money. So use what we have and stop wasting money and just... Okay, I, I have to take exception with your characterization of wasting money. I believe this is a vital project. When we brought in the, I have to finish this one. When we brought in the engineers to look at building an OEM, we looked at the ice arena, we looked at the community center at the West End, we looked at City Hall, we looked at the auxiliary police building, we looked at every space we had, including space in City Hall, and this was the most um, viable solution. And I can't live in what ifs. So we have the money, we put in for the grant, we were approved for the grant, it's fully funded, and we're going to move forward. But we always if hear if that can, it's fully funded, and then it's Wait, never I, fully funded. I can funded. just interrupt. If we, don't, if, if we don't use this money, it's my understanding that the money is lost. And I, I don't want to speak for everybody else, but if we're preparing for a storm or we're preparing for some other type of disaster, to the extent that we can keep these things in one place and based upon, look, I'm not a uh, disaster expert, but the experts are telling us that this is the most appropriate thing for us to do. If, in fact, we build another city hall that is beautiful, I'm fairly certain that we would be able to accommodate this type of office in that place. We've, we've gone through all of the process of looking and analyzing different locations, and this seems to be the most appropriate. I'm not the expert, but the engineers and the experts have said to us, this is the most appropriate location. So while we plan for the future, whether it be with a comprehensive plan or something else, I, I personally don't want to be part of a place where we can't, we don't have, if we have the opportunity to build this office and it's fully funded and we have the money, why we would hold off while we attempt to modify the by city city hall, we can agree to disagree on it. But if we, we have can, the money, absolutely, I wouldn't but it's fully it. funded Wait, by some taxpayer. No, I'm sorry, it's fully funded by somebody pair taxpayer's money. I'm in the middle of finishing my point. So you had an opportunity to finish yours. Just give me an opportunity to finish mine. If we believe that we want to be as prepared as possible for an emergency, and this is the way to do it then I, I don't want to wait to do it any longer. We have the funding here. Maybe there'll be funding opportunities in the future. I understand that money is tight everywhere. The state is saying it. We see it in the newspaper every single day. Villages, counties, towns all over the state are saying that there's financing and other financial constraints on municipalities. With that said, if we have an opportunity to do this now and the funding is there, we've been working on this project for years, I, I don't see why we would hold off on having and enhancing our emergency services. Okay, so tell me how it's fully funded. There, there's there's a number of state grants that provide that money. Paid by I recognize taxpayers. That. Okay. Taxpayers like me and everybody else si sitting here. Fair enough. So if we don't need to waste taxpayers' money from any other towns or villages, then why should we? And just like tell them, like, listen, let's just hold off. We can like make do with like space. The same way as you do in your own home or your own business. You make do with what you have or what you can afford. I would hardly suggest that building an office that enhances our emergency response would be something that should wait until future plans that are a possibility that are not even in the specific planning stages. So we can agree to disagree, but to the extent that we can do anything to enhance our preparedness for emergencies, I fully support. Okay, then we'll agree to disagree. It's about the engineering of the OEM, right? <laughs> Good evening, sir. Just state your name and address for the record. Good evening. Brendan Healy, New Hampshire Street, over in Long Beach. I'll start speaking to the mic. Um, first, I'd like to applaud the city for looking into building an OEM and building an EOC. Uh, th this is coming from somebody that was in the Nassau County OEM during Hurricane Sandy, coordinated private sector response to the city of Long Beach, 
So I can tell you that I'm surprised that the city does not have a current functioning OEM today and the requirements that need to be in place to build an OEM is more than just a contract. You have to have environmental controls, as the engineering report states. You need to have proper staffing. And it's very important to have that interoperability in a city such as Arlington. So just want to say I do applaud the fact that the city is embarking on this effort. And it is going to be critically important for all department heads. One could argue that staffing might be in question. But in terms of having all those resources in one room can save lives and expedite resources like they're built on. So that's my comment. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, seeing none, next item. Item five is a resolution authorizing the city manager and the city controller to transfer funds within the 2017-2018 budget. Okay, this is a standard uh, budgetary process that's used by all, it, it, if not all, most municipalities. And what happens is the year winds down, you are due to the family budget. You have your food budget, you have your rent budget, you have your car budget. Well, you got a great deal on the car, so you have a little extra money in the car budget, but you don't have enough food. So at the end of the year, you transfer the car budget left over into the food, and you have a nice meal. Pretty much that's what we do in city government. We have a line item budget, which has about a thousand, I couldn't tell you how many lines. And at the end of the year, as we get close to the end of the year, we see where we have pennies here or there left over, pennies here or there where we had to overspend because a couple of months ago we had to buy new chemicals for the uh, wastewater treatment plant as well as the uh, our drip po potable water plant, and those chemicals went up. So that was an additional expense. Where does that money come from? It comes out of the general fund when we rebalance things. If we were to go with what normally is done throughout the majority of the year, where anything over $1,500 to show the extra transparency is given to the city council and the public to see, then that's the, uh, that's the way we operate. What I will commit to do is we will make a document of every one of these transfers that will be available after July 1st. And the council, we, the council has already asked for this, so that they're provided with this information and they'll have the two oversight. And however they want to share it with the public, that's fine. But this is simply an accounting principle to readjust our books for, to end the, fiscally, the fiscal year responsibly. Okay. I I did ask for a, uh, a comprehensive list of all the items of where the money was moved around, um, so I appreciate you mentioning that right now. Any other questions from the council? Any questions from the public? Okay. Seeing no, seeing none, next item. Item six is a resolution delegating to the city controller of the city of Long Beach, Nassau County, New York, the powers to authorize the issuance of $4 million tax anticipation notes of said city, or so much thereof as may be necessary in anticipation of the collection of taxes levied for the fiscal year commencing July 1, 2018, and to prescribe the terms, form, and contents and provide for the sale and credit enhancement of such notes. Okay, a lot of our general fund has been committed to Sandy, and it is reimbursable. But unfortunately, um, with Harvey and I Marie, I believe, uh, the FEMA is inundated with claims, and the older claims take a little bit longer to process because we're not in the same emergency state that we once were. So this is a way to, to continue our operations while we're awaiting reimbursement of all the funds. I'd just like to call up the co Commissioner DPW up here for a second. So this, this $4 million is an anticipation note of money we're expected to get? Yes, this is I money um, <laughs> have uh, owed to us for projects that we've closed out, FEMA projects. So these are closed uh, out? They're closed the paperwork's out. Paperwork's approved. We have submitted all the paperwork that we're supposed to. It's just a matter of waiting now for FEMA to release the checks and the state to release their share. 90% of it will come from, the from FEMA and 10% from the state. It actually totals out to about $4.8 million. Okay. So there's, not, there's nothing else for us to do except wait. There's nothing else for us to do except wait. We have other projects that we're working on finishing that will also be closing out, but that's down the road. Okay. Thank you. What is the anticipated wait for this, for all of the paperwork? Typically, typically in the beginning when we were closing projects out, uh, my understanding was we were getting reimbursed in about 
two to three months. This has been taking a little longer lately, so it could be six to seven months. So are we already, just give us a sense of the calendar. Have we submitted this paperwork three, um, six months these ago? Well, it's, it's multiple projects, and they've been submitted over a two-month period. So we have to wait till the project is completely done. We've closed out all the invoices with the contractors once that's done, and then we have to go th you know, through and make sure that uh, everything is uh, acceptable, and we send them in for approval to FEMA. They've all been approved, so uh, it's just a matter of waiting for them to cut a check now. That's really the only thing that needs to be done. Thank you. I have a quick question, uh, Commissioner. Do we have any reason to believe that we won't be reimbursed with these funds? Absolutely none. Thank you. Any other questions? Is 100% of this going toward uh, or reimbursable through FEMA? Is any of it going to non-FEMA? Is it going to salaries? Is it going to city operations? Well, some, some of this reimburses salaries that were expended on this project over the time. Each one of these uh, work projects that we set up we're allowed to uh, put our time in with people that work on it. So a lot of this would be in our office, Bill Martone um, and, and Joe Fabrizio, some, some of the secretarial help. All that money will get reimbursed. Some of the projects that we did in-house with our CSEA staff, uh, their salaries will get reimbursed. Their, their uh, uh, payouts would get reimbursed to the city. So it's all part of what we spend with contractors, engineers, and any in-house labor. Or, uh, or any, you know, uh, technical work. Okay, anything else? Yeah, uh, President Obama, can is there someone that could speak to um, the debt service or payment in terms of the rollout of this $4 million? I don't think that, that, uh, that's, that's not that would appropriate. Be we have a deputy ca uh, controller, Erin. Okay, so we don't have any information tonight about the rollout. Will it take... Are we anticipating two years, four years, ten years for this rollout? No, I think it was just six to eight months. We're anticipating six to eight months is what I heard. We we were in a similar position last year with a, a different. You know, understand the boardwalk was a forty-four million dollar project, so we've been getting reimbursed. Last year uh, we did this same thing in June, and we were reimbursed in October which is about four or five months later, and we do anticipate the same kind of time frame. So that, that's why I'm asking the question. So in other words, six, month, six to eight months from now, are we going to pay back the entire amount? Are we paying back portions of the amount? How, is that, how are we going to roll the money back into the budget? Well, the, the one we did last year, which was a RAN, which is a revenue anticipation note, uh, which is different from this, which is a tax anticipation note, sure. the revenue anticipation note uh, came with conditions that we borrowed it in June and you couldn't pay it back in advance. So we have the money for that. We can't use it for anything else, but come June, we will take last year's October payment from FEMA and the state and apply it to that entire debt service, which will happen very similarly uh, in this. There are little subtle differences between TAN and RAN, but I grew up with the penal law and the CPL, so I'm learning. <laughs> So at this point, we don't know what the interest rate would be on this or the debt service. Also, the resolution allows um, allows renewal of of the notes, and New York finance law allows them to be renewed, I believe, up to five years. So in reality, this could be stretched out to five-year repayment, correct? I just read the New York finance law a little while ago, and it said you could renew them up to five years. No, the RANs are a three-year, and the TANs, I do believe, are five. But I, I, we will check and get definitive information. But I know the RANs are definitely three years. Right, but this isn't a RAN. This is a tax anticipation yeah, note, which is five. What our intention is to pay it right away. But we, we anticipate our intention is to pay it right away. Okay, in light of the fact that I don't have information with respect to the interest of the debt service, I move to table this item until the next meeting. What, what is I second it. I need a second. Yeah, motion to uh, 
We have a motion to table item number number six. That's I'm member Bandai. Can, can, uh, can we I adjust vote? the microphones because we can't hear anything? Bef before I vote, I just have a, a question for council. What are the ramifications of potentially not doing this right now, and do we have a time frame that we have to, uh, do, uh, you know, pass the TAN? My understanding is that we do have to pass the TAN before the end, before really before the end of April. Um, we can hear you. My understanding is that we do have to to um, adopt this TAN before the end of April, but that's not based on um, any unique insight or knowledge that I possess as the corporation council. Okay, so that gives us two weeks then to find out the information we need about debt service and um, and and the potential for a five year versus how quickly we should pay it back. So call the vote. Okay. Motion to table item number six. Councilmember Bandel. Yes. Councilmember Mandel. Yes. Councilmember Moore. Yes. Vice President Diamond. Yes. President Aramo. Yes. Okay. Item's been tabled. Item seven is a resolution authorizing publication for hearing of an ordinance authorizing financing for cost of separation payments to or for the benefit of employees of the city, stating the estimated total cost thereof is $2,100,000, appropriating said amount therefore and authorizing the issuance of not to exceed $2,100,000 bonds of said city to finance said appropriation. This item is for publication only. A hearing will be held on April 17th at 7 p.m. On to the voting. Item one is a resolution granting waiver of all street parking requirements for premise 68 West Park Avenue for a tobacco vape convenience store. Can you produce and move the adoption of this item? I will. Mr. Gaffney? I will. Voting, Councilmember Bendel. Yes. Councilmember Mandel. Yes. Councilmember Moore. Yes. Vice President Diamond. Yes. President Arama. Yes. Item two is a resolution authorizing settlement of an action brought by the city of Long Beach against Isla Kagan and Polina Kagan. Can you produce and move the adoption of this item? I will. Mr. Gaffney? I will. Voting, Councilmember Bendel. Yes. Councilmember Mandel. Yes. Councilmember Moore. Yes. Vice President Diamond. I vote yes, but I want to take an opportunity to thank the attorneys and Corporation Council for pursuing this and for ensuring that we received the funds that they were due. So thank you. And I vote yes. President Arama. Yes. Item three is a resolution authorizing the city manager to enter into an agreement for engineering services for, this for the Long Beach Drainage Improvements Project and to amend the budget. Who introduced and moved the adoption of this item as amended? I will. Mr. Gaffney? I, I will. will. I'm sorry, who, who got that? It's a combination okay. of them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Councilmember Bendel? Yes. Councilmember Mandel? Yes. Councilmember Moore? Yes. Vice yes. President Diamond? Yes. President Arama. Yes. Item four is a resolution authorizing the city manager to enter into an agreement for construction, administration, and inspection services for the establishment of an office of emergency management for the city of Long Beach and to amend the budget. Can you produce and move the adoption of this item as amended? I will. Mr. Gaffney? I will. Voting, Councilmember Bendel. I just want to address um, Ms. Egan uh, when she came up with her comment about do we really need, do we really need this? Uh, you know, I have some experience myself in this area, and I can't overemphasize the importance a facility like this actually does make in a catastrophe. Um, so I vote yes. Councilmember Mandel. Um, I was here during Sandy, and I saw how we had to mobilize, and it would be irresponsible for us not to implement this. So I vote yes. Councilmember Moore. Yeah, I just want to once again just emphasize the the importance of preparedness. Um, this is what we are about. This is what makes our city move forward. However, I do also need to just be vocal about my disappointment with respect to information and the sharing of information regarding the decisions that were made over the summer regarding staff hiring. With that, I vote yes. Vice President Diamond. Yes. President Arama. And while we do recognize it is, in fact, tax dollars, as Ms. Egan was alluding to, it's the state dollars. Um, it is actually federal dollars, um, which are still, in fact, tax dollars, but OEM is constructed and designed by federal dollars. My vote is, for y is yes. 
Item five is a resolution authorizing the city manager and the city controller to transfer funds within the 2017-2018 budget. Would you please move the adoption of this item? I will. Second? I will. Morning, Councilmember Dunbar. As the, as the budget's beginning to shape up, uh, I, I feel this, while it may be minor and routine, it, it abdicates some responsibility from the council to track finances, um, so I vote no. Councilmember Mandel. Yes. Councilmember Moore. Yes. Uh, Vice President Diamond. Yes. President Rama. Yes. And item seven is a resolution authorizing publication for hearing of an ordinance authorizing financing for cost of separation payments to or for the benefit of employees of the city, stating the estimated total cost thereof is two. $2,100,000 appropriating said amount therefore and authorizing the issuance of not to exceed $2,100,000 bonds of said city to finance said appropriation. <laughs> Would you please move the adoption of this item? I will. Julia Sharpie. I will. Good morning, Councilmember Dunbar. Uh, again, as people are hearing the rumors, you know, obviously there's budget challenges this year and the council has yet to have one substantive discussion about dealing with those and we're putting things on the agenda to borrow money uh, when we can't even figure out the situation we're in now it's, this just doesn't seem appropriate I vote no <laughs> Councilmember Mandel it's my understanding that this is on for publication purposes so based on that I vote yes Councilmember Moore in light of all of the conversation that we've had today, I'm going to just ask and request that um, our president, as along with our vice president, have a meeting with all of the council to discuss the ongoing issues with respect to um, our debt service, with respect to our fiscal reports, and I will also vote no. Vice President Diamond. As council member uh, Mandel mentioned, this is an item to, for publication for a hearing and it's, it relates to separation pay for individuals who have already left. The implication for not voting for this would be somewhat catastrophic, so I vote yes. President Obama. This is for publication for a hearing, so the hearing will be next week, so instead of grandstanding at this moment, I vote yes. Point of order, but this is not grandstanding. This is about asking for information. All of us should have the same information, and until that happens, we can't make decisions. That's what the hearing is for. No, that's what your responsibility is, to make sure that we all have the same information. When that happens and we call a meeting, that's then we can That's what the have hearing is for, publication of but a I hearing. I don't want to come to the hearing and, lear and learn about information like everyone else. If there's information that we need, I've had no trouble asking the Please share some city information manager. with me, Councilwoman I, Diamond. If there's specific information that you want, I'm happy to share what I have with you. But Thank I've you. received answers to the questions that I've asked. I look I've forward asked. to our meeting. We have a scheduled meeting tomorrow. Okay, city manager's monthly personnel report has been filed by the city clerk. Who will make a motion to close the meeting? I will. Second? I will. Voting, Councilmember Dunbar. Yes. Councilmember Mandel. Yes. Councilmember Moore. Yes. Vice President Diamond. Yes. President Rama. Yes. Okay, we enter our good and welfare section. <coughs> you receive three minutes of uninterrupted time. And let's get going. Miss um, Treston. I'm sorry? Oh, sure, sure. Make your way up here and then uh, Miss Judy Vining. Take your time, Miss Treston. When you get up here, I'll, I'll call you. Uh, Judy Vining, 410 East Broadway, Long Beach. Um, a couple of things, really. My question is, uh, I was here a couple of weeks ago when we talked about perhaps doing something, or I asked about perhaps doing something proactively, administratively, so that we can ban hookah lounges within the city. I, I just wonder what happens after we come up here, and I know you don't, your policy is not to respond, but 
where does it go after that? You know, I mean, does it just sit here? Does it, I mean, who answers who? Who brings it up? How, what goes on? What goes on when something is brought up? I yeah. mean, sometimes sometimes it is discussed by the council. Sometimes, sometimes it's not. It sometimes so uh, how does uh, someone from the know? staff <laughs> will write a memo saying that this is not possible okay. or okay. it is possible. I get that. So how long does that process take? Or I mean, it generally depends, I guess, if someone drives it or not. Okay. So I drove it last two weeks ago. I'm asking it again. Can we take a look at? So we can take a look at any kind of business we do or don't want to see in the city of Long Beach, and that would be done as part of a comprehensive plan and creating a planning board. Okay, so the answer is if somebody comes before the zoning board for a variance at, for hookah lounge and there's precedent for giving variances for off-street parking, we then open that door. And it wasn't a hook if you're talking about the item tonight, it wasn't a hookah lounge. No, I know that wasn't. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm well aware oh. of that. What I'm saying is should something happen between now and the comprehensive plan, the door opens for that. And since we're about, and you certainly are, you brought up the uh, 21 and over, mm -hmm. um, this is another thing that could protect our children proactively right. before we're playing mop up and having to police it. And so I'm asking the council to consider I don't know, directing the Corporation Council. I don't, I don't know what your process is. But to consider looking at that so that we don't have to face it in the future, that's you know one thing. The other thing I need to ask you is, we talked last time also about notification that the SLA requires that a vendor who wants to apply for a license must notify the city clerk or the community board in the city um, 30 days before they apply for a license. But there's no opportunity for public either support or um, problem with it because you don't know what you don't know. If there's no publication of it, if there's no um, information given out to the public, by the time the license is applied for, it's a done deal. Can I just have an opportunity? Same as us. Can I? I just. Well I it just doesn't have to be though. I just want to respond to your your first point with regard to this the vape store and tobacco store. I don't think that anybody who supported it really would like to see a vape store across the street. Or I mean, I, it's not my thing. No, I don't do any of those either. things. But I I think that that actually demonstrates the need for not only a comprehensive plan, but a change in the zoning so that we have an opportunity. Look, that's a permissive use. We couldn't say whether we had a planning board or no planning board. We can't just, it's, if that's a proper use by saying no, we just simply, no, 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 but what I'm saying to you is that I agree with you. I think that we do, but I think that a piecemeal approach to changing and preventing those type of things might not really get us to where we want to be. For the most part, I would agree with you. But since we now know that the governor has convened a committee to discuss and study recreational marijuana, we know where this is going. So we know what other municipalities have done across the state, and that is taking advantage of getting ahead that of it. May, that may be accurate, Ms. Finding, but the, the is issue accurate. here is off-street parking. And that's not... No, I'm that's not, not talking... No, but I understand, but, it, you know, if we're No, I am not talking about okay. that, that establishment at all. Okay, I, I am talking... If, if to the extent you aren't talking about that, understand that that's not the proper vehicle. I for understand. Okay. I am not okay. talking about that. Just clarifying. Okay. I, I'm well aware that that was the issue. Understood. What I am saying is enacting legislation or however you would do it that would prohibit hookah lounges would also prohibit those already existing vape lounges from turning into that. Another way of protecting our children. And if I, I just wanted to also respond to your second part with regard to the notification. To the extent that it would need a code amendment for us to amend our code to require that we publish it on the website before, within those 30 days, to give the public an opportunity to pursue and oppose it with the state, I, I would call on the members of the council, unless there's a legal well, my, prohibition. My understanding for is we're not notified forward. either. I'm sorry? We're not notified either. The well, city we clerk have is notified. The, the clerk yeah. is notified. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah whenever, whenever, whenever an establishment uh, either uh, renews or 
applies for a new s l a license they have to send the city with thirty day notice before they even make that application before. Right, so if we, to the extent that we need to amend our code, I, I mean, presumably, I unless it's something no, no, it wouldn't that, require a but I would ask that the, the city take the appropriate steps to ensure that that information is published within, say, five or six days from us receiving it to give appropriate amount of time for you to for well, you to see for it and find it. anyone to, really. Wh whomever it is, whatever yeah. it is. But obviously we can't do it on the, you have to give a little bit of time for the no, city to, for sure, to post but it. Um, but it, nobody's within a couple of days. Day one, I would agree. But what if you okay. either put it on the website or? So, so moving forward, the clerk will notify the city manager and we'll have uh, uh, when an application for a new uh, SLA license comes, we'll figure out how and where, but that would we'll be have great. the city manager do it. That would be great. Thank you. And I would just ask that the city manager that we post on the <coughs> website that that's our, our new policy. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> yep, she's coming up. She's ready. Miss Liz Treston. Please just state your name again for the record. Liz Preston, Long Beach. For the last four years, I've been talking to numerous legislative bodies regarding about GOSER, rebuilding and resilience, and honestly, it is exhausting. As you may or may not know, GOSER is slowly shrinking, both financially and morally, leaving homeowners, towns, and businesses literally up in the air. A number of recovery groups have done some informal forensic surveys, and we've found a number of issues that we are hoping that you and the county will address. One is that building departments need to communicate with each other. Long Beach needs to communicate with Freeport, Town of Hempstead, in order to reveal con contractor frauds and contractors without license. Our faith in Ghoster is wavering. So tonight I'm, I'm kind of speechless that we're putting our faith in a system that is failing the residents of the South Shore. That you're guaranteed this money and we're not is just, it's just I'm, I admire your faith in Ghoster. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Treston. Uh, Mr. Deer, Arizona Street. Oh, Dean, I'm sorry. State your name and address for the record. John Dean. 106 Arizona Avenue, this is the best part of Long Beach. After 49 years, you've taken away parking when West Park came new. I have a family van. Now I can't park it on Park Street because they say cars over five feet can't park there. I don't know if you're aware of this, parking state did be further restricted from the West End because of the new style of construction of houses. So now what you're doing is you're taking families and saying, you can't park in your house. Besides that, that's just an issue. The restriction actually doesn't do anything. I went to the traffic area, they told me that it was to help people see. Most people when they're sitting in their cars are at best four and a half feet off the ground. Five feet doesn't provide any visibility. A car that's five feet doesn't add to visibility when you're sitting at four and a half feet. And this goes whether you're in a park in, in your driveway or north and south or Arizona where I live or Delaware or whatever. You can't see until you inch out into the parking spot, whether it's a five foot car, or six foot car. And by the way, uh, you know, it might be 60 feet off the edge of the corner but at 70 feet, you got a construction van, it, it, it doesn't accomplish anything. 
The real problem on Park Street is not the parking. It's the flow of traffic. It's the only residential area in Long Beach that does not have some type of traffic control east and west every block. If you go to any street anywhere, you're going to see a stop sign or a traffic light at every corner. That's the only area where you do not have a stop sign and traffic control on every corner. Now, I've lived there on that location for 49 years. I can tell you in the last couple of years, I can't, I, it, it, sometimes it takes me six minutes to get into my car, wait for the west traffic to stop. I can get out, now I have to wait for the east traffic to go through and try to maneuver around to get out of the west end. It's just absurd. And if you're walking, you get the westbound traffic coming because the light at uh, New York is uh, green. That turns red. Now you got all the cars to finish. By the time that happens, the eastbound on Delaware is green, and they're not going to let you pass either. So the only way you can pass is actually to walk out and force the people to stop. And if you're on Arizona or, or um, Pennsylvania, and I, a number of uh, any other street, if you're sitting there, you're trying to, to make a right or a left, that the speed of the traffic is just so absurd. There's, there's no enforcement uh, of anything there. And, and that silly uh, stoplight that you have on, new, on uh, uh, blinking lights, people don't even stop for that. They go right around there, there's no enforcement. Yeah. Thank you very much. I just, I just have a question. The, the, I want the, the sign taken down so I can park near my house. Please. The vehicles o that say over five feet, they're only on the corners, is that right? That would be your... Yes, it is a visibility issue, and um, not to, to quibble, but the average height of a vehicle that's under five foot, which is the top of the roof, you still get an added visibility through the hood of the car, through the street, even sitting in the car. But it's only on the corners, is that correct? Yes, it's only on the corners to increase visibility at the intersection, which is recommended by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, the Manual for Uniform Traffic Control Devices, and they strongly prohibit... Uh, suggest against that, uh, I'll use the softest language uh, versus... Yes, um, versus just to respond to you, I, I challenge you to go on the north side of Park on Arizona and come down in the middle of uh, traffic in rush hour in the afternoon or the morning, and I guarantee you if any car is parked okay. in that 60-foot area, right. east or west, you're not going to see anything until you inch out into the west. And that goes for both sides. Any street, doesn't matter. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, Brendan Healy. State your name for the record. Sure. Brendan Healy, New Hampshire Street, Long Beach, New York. I represent over 100 property owners and residents uh, in the West End. Uh, we are calling for an improvement of the quality of life uh, in the West End of Long Beach, specifically related to the operation of Minnesota's Bar and Grill. We are asking the Minnesotas and their new operators who filed a 30 day notification to the city on February 22nd, asking them to be good neighbors to work with us as a community, and to be active participants in creating uh, a good lifestyle in the West End. We have a petition uh, for the city. Okay. Have you, have you met with the new owners of, the, of Minnesota? So we have not. Um, as Judy Vining just pointed out before, we actually had to FOIL uh, to the city the request to obtain the information on the liquor license. So we're not calling for a ban on the bar, but what we are calling for are resolutions to some of the concerns that we've been experiencing over the past few years. In fact, some of the residents that are living in the West End have experienced issues going on 20, 30 years, um, not just with Minnesota's, but with other establishments. Specifically with Minnesota's, the current structure is not conducive to allow for a nightclub that operates at 4 a.m. with vibrations that extend far beyond the four walls of the premise. I was surprised to learn that the building department provided a use 
uh, application. They approved the use application on March 2nd to approve them as a bar cabaret, given that they've received over 22 complaints around the structure itself. Again, we're not, by no means are we calling for a closure of Minnesota's. What we are calling for is the city to respond to the state liquor authority requesting stipulations around the method of operation and how they operate in the West End. The West End's a vibrant community, we know that. There's a fine line between the enjoyment that we have in the West End and living standards. And unfortunately, the previous owners of Minnesota's, the ones that operated and took over the bar in 2016, have crossed that line many, many times. We've tried to work with those owners on three separate occasions. They have been dismissive to us and to other residents, but they've not heeded our concerns. Uh, we have worked with Police Commissioner Tagney, as well as previous City Manager Shearman, who have been responsive, and they have stepped up enforcement in the neighborhood. The only issue with that is the police department's the last line of defense, and it's unfair to burden our police officers and law enforcement with quality of life concerns when that really starts with permitting and building you know, occupancy issues and asking Minnesotas and the operators to be good citizens and good neighbors. So that's all we're calling for, that's what we're asking for, um, and we hope that the city can respond to the State Liquor Authority uh, in the fact that they will receive notification that there will be a new on-premise liquor license to be submitted within probably the next 30 to 60 days. Okay. I wanna leave you with one, one last quote, if I can. These are, these are comments from residents. We did a survey. For 20 years, Minnesota has been getting away with disturbing everyone too close to the home. Last year was out of control. At one point, a couple climbed to the roof of Minnesota at 9.30 p.m., engaged, engaged in sexual acts in front of families and children. We love the Long Beach community. We live across from the inn and don't experience any of the problems with the bar as we do with Minnesota's. We need to do extensive soundproofing to the building so we, the neighbors, do not have to dance along to the sound of music every night. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Eileen Hessian. Eileen Hessian. I thought we were going to talk about the budget tonight, but uh, we're not. So I'm ju I just have a couple of general questions. The first one is, how are we doing with the city manager uh, search? Any closer? We're doing good. We Council has a meeting tomorrow night, as I said before, and uh, that's one of the items we're scheduled to discuss. So you hope to have somebody in place? Do you have any idea when? Soon. Soon. <laughs> Soon. Thank you. Um, also, I know we're having the Gay Pride Weekend again. And as much as I enjoyed it last year, I didn't think it was a big success for them, so I was a little bit surprised that they're coming for the three days again. Um, did they pay us what they were supposed to pay us? Um, they gave us their entire grant, but I do think it ended up costing us more than we had anticipated, um, which we do not have the money for this year, if that's the next follow-up. Oh, so are they not coming back then? They are coming back, oh, but it's so I believe it's going to be of a smaller scale. Okay, and also, I was thinking if they give us money, maybe the other events should. Uh, you know, I don't want to step on any toes, but some of the big events that we have, like Irish Day or even the volleyball tournament where we have to have extra police on and we're paying so much money for that, even the flowers that go on Washington Boulevard, which are gorgeous and that's my neighborhood, let the Hibernians pay for it. They make a lot of money on that day and give us some money for the cops. I think we're looking for a model where the user pays for all the... Good. And I think if you had, you know, it was a little scary when John sort of mentioned that um, there was not as much discussion about the budget when it's, that's scary the to think The budget hasn't of. been presented to us yet. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, but we have had budget meetings. What I am and thinking, wait, wait, though. We have, just true. in response to your question, we have had budget meetings. A number of us were there, and those that weren't able to be there were given an opportunity to follow up by telephone. Uh, so we have had some discussion regarding it. It's not that there Good. I feel no like the discussion. budget should almost be the most important thing that you I talk I about I at every city agree council with meeting. I, I think, think that we all agree with you. with you. I mean, we are, it sounds like from rumors that we're in a lot of trouble, and I think you need to have a citizen group as part of the budget hearings or throughout the year for different ideas because we have a lot of talented people in this city. Um, and also, since you uh, interrupted me or I interrupted you, 
was sort of an embarrassing display between the two of you before. Um, I think I have to agree with Anissa on this, that if there is city council meeting or discussions going on, the whole city council should be there unless they choose not to attend. But if anything is, I mean, you said to her, ask me and I'll tell you. Well, you can't ask somebody no, no. if you don't know I what's going I said, on. I, what I did say was, was that everything that I have asked for, if there's information that I need before I vote on an item and I ask for it, I've received it. Otherwise, no, I understand I, that, but so sometimes that you don't know enough to ask. Was that if I have, if there's information that I need, then for I'm, example, and if there's something that I, I ask questions on all different Yes, items. I understand that, but if you don't know that something is going on, you can't ask. I'm going to give you a personal example. Many years this ago, the my items father... That were, the items that are on the agenda are Thank provided... You. So right, you're interrupting me. Please the stop. The items that are on the agenda are I provided three to minutes. all the council members at the same exact time. I actually probably receive them after everybody else does. So... We all have an opportunity, and I think that we can ask for information. Right, if some people on want. the council are meeting separately, I that should not that be that done. I don't, to okay, as far as I know, that's Between not the two of us, we've been interrupting each other, and you kind of raised your voice at Nora earlier, but you were the one who interrupted her. I just thought you should relook at the tape okay. and see that, okay? Thank you. Um, Ms. Session, just one point I'd like to make. When I took over as the acting city manager, I instructed the staff that any request from the council be responded to to the entire council. So even if Ms. Di Diamond was to ask a question, the response goes to all five. So they, I do try to keep them yeah, in the discussion. Yeah, you know, what I'm saying is this. Many years ago, my father-in-law had a heart attack. I didn't know about it. How could I ask? Should I call somebody up and say, did he have a heart attack? No, I had no idea he had a heart attack until somebody told me. If nobody told me, I wouldn't know. Do you see what I'm saying? If there was something going on that she didn't know enough to ask about, you can't ask. How can you ask about something you don't know? We point were point of now information I'm using in, up in my relation time. to the agenda. You alluded to the fact that there are meetings that are taking place without certain council members. I thought That's you not alluded the case. to that no. fact earlier. I absolutely her. did not say that I is not what I said. I said two of you had met. No, okay. no, I did not say that. No, I did not say that there were meetings. I said any information that I have asked for, I receive the answers to what I asked for. That's all that I said. I did not say that there were meetings that have taken place Thank without certain council members. Point of information, um, Commissioner Tagney has been wonderful in terms of making sure that all of us received information. Um, this is the first time because this is I'm going into my third year. And this is the first time when I ask for information or before I can ask for information, he's provided that information. But that's not the issue. Um, he, made a, he made a stipulation that all of us, if there was something that we were asking, that we would CC all of the members of the council regarding that so that all of these answers can be, we can have the information. But that's not always the case. And that's why this information that's, that's being shared today that people know about that some people don't know about. So we have to work on that. It's not for us to have a conversation here. And that's why I made the, co the statement this evening that I'm asking for, for our vice president uh, as well as our president to call a meeting where we can have that conversation, all five of us present, so that we can have that conversation so that we do not have to do it here. Sometimes, sometimes just briefly, sometimes when I come here, and questions are brought up, it sounds like things were not discussed ahead of time. And it seems to me that the city council should be talking about these issues before the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Is that Myrna? Myrna J. Is that right? All right, please just state your name and address for the record. Myrna J, Long Beach, New York. Use the microphone, Myrna. My question to everyone here is, what are we doing about the disarray of our roads here? We've got tremendous potholes, cars are getting destroyed, and no one takes care of the roads. I mean, this is month after week after month after year after year, and nothing is ever fixed here. We're taxed to death, and you guys seem to spend money on the things that you feel are important, but our roads are not fixed. So we do have a, a pretty aggressive road program. I think our DPW commissioner would agree. Um, the winter is just pretty much wrapping up, although it did snow yesterday. Um, and we do, starting last year, we I do see some of our CSEA workers here as well. 
Um, we started repairing the potholes in a different way so that they don't come back. Um, but you know, with the expansion and contraction, that is that is the issue. But they do get fixed fairly quickly. If you have you used the app at all, because that's really the best way for potholes Sir? specifically. I beg to differ with you. Okay. I drive in Long Beach locally, and I suggest you all get in your cars and drive. We all drive and and week after understand. Week after month. They yeah. are not fixed, and they get worse, and they get deeper, and cars are getting destroyed. And okay, we, so we, we do, do you want to speak to the, because it is, it is one thing we do uh, well, we're getting spend an money on. Well, I'm sorry? We're getting an F for the F. This has been a particularly rough winter because of the, the deep freeze, and you've got a lot of thawing cycles. So we do have a lot of excess potholes. But we have a pothole crew out every single day from street department doing potholes. Uh, also, last uh, city council meeting, we requested to put on on the uh, website the road work that we've done over the years. Mm -hmm. And when you look at it, you know, it's a, it's a million and a half dollars a mile of road, okay? Um, and we have 52 miles of road. But when you look at the progress we've made over the last five years on that, you'll see a color-coded map on the website under public works, and you'll see the amount of road work we've done amount of road work we've gotten National Grid to do to repair their streets on the West End is really, in terms of most communities, we probably have more road work going on than anybody. Potholes are an issue. Uh, during the colder weather, we can only repair them temporarily till we can get hot asphalt in there. Uh, once we make the final repairs, they, they will, will disappear. And we do about $400,000 a year in the overlays where we take the worst roads and try to overlay just the road without doing the other construction. There is, if you look on that site, you'll see there's an awful lot of work that goes into our roads, and our CSEA members really do do a tremendous job doing that. When when do we start the hot asphalt? Uh, I would imagine by the end of April, the plants will be in full operation. Okay. Sure. I, we we drive. Our supervisors drive. Well, where is it? Roosevelt and Shore. I'll have the street department address it tomorrow. Mr. Vinny Lees. Please just state your name and address for the record. Uh, Vinny Lees, 418 East Hudson Street. I just had a quick question. Um, Mr. Bendo asking, uh, that was our deputy controller. Yep. Yes. Um, How is the search going for the new controller going right now? That's, that's my we, we had a viable candidate. Uh, she was ready to come to work and pulled out at the last second. Uh, we are now looking to engage a headhunter because we haven't gotten a lot, of, a lot of additional resumes. We do have a couple that we're looking to interview very soon, but I have to tell you that the, um, the budget process has consumed a lot of my time and ability to conduct that search. All right, thank you. Are you gonna be uh, posting it again on the website? Oh, it's posted? Oh, yeah. All right, because it was just like, Again, my wife has two degrees from Villanova and this stuff, but it was kind of crazy when you have a council and asking questions about how long percentages can be, how long bonds could be extended, and the person that's currently sitting in like that seat doesn't have those answers. Isn't that alarming? No, because the rate is established at the time of borrowing. You're never going to know the rate ahead of time. No, no, I understand with the rate and stuff, but being able to borrow money that they don't understand that you can extend bonds and notes and certain things by certain years, you know, that is alarming that we don't have one. So hopefully we find one, but have a wonderful day. Ms. Heather Lakata. Please just state your name and address. Sure. My name is Heather Lakata, uh, Kirkwood Street, Midtown. So, um, I'm sorry, I haven't been to many of these. I've spent the last 20 years commuting on the Long Island Railroad, but my family goes back to the 30s in Long Beach. Uh, my daughter is third generation of Long Beach High School graduates. My mother graduated in 61, I was in 84, and I, for the life of me, I cannot remember what year my daughter graduated, but she graduated. Um, I see a lot of um, conflict going on 
And as a businesswoman, um, I take pause with that. But as a resident, it frightens me. I did not expect to come here tonight and to see the arguing that's been going on. I think we're all here and we all want what's best. We might have a different of opinion on how to get there, but this scares me. Um, putting that to the side, the reason why I did come up here is because I spent the last 20 years commuting, I did not have the opportunity to come to these meetings. And I think a large community of our people get on the trains every single day. And nowadays, six o'clock is the new five o'clock. And you will not see many people on those five o'clock trains. It starts getting really busy down in Penn at the 555. 555, 613. I would love to see more people at these meetings that commute every day. I work from home now. I'm done with the commuting, so I'm able to come here. We have a lot of people that live here that don't have that opportunity. And I would really like for all of you to consider moving some of your meetings to 7.30. 30 minutes could really make a difference. I think that we have smart people that are interested in what's going on here, but they're not home in time. So that was, it's not more of a question, it's a request for you to take that under consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations on working from home. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Jay Gosler. <coughs> Please state your name for the record. Yeah, hi, good evening, Jay Gosler. Um, it's not gonna be one of my characteristic uh, rants against something that, that you guys have done wrong. I uh, just wanna talk about the uh, upcoming zoning board meeting for, uh, I'm sorry, am I doing what I sit back there and criticize everybody else for doing? Um, the upcoming zoning board meeting that uh, we've been forced to reschedule as a result of a court decision. Now, I understand you guys are kind of boxed into a corner to support ISTAR's uh, IDA application, but for whatever reason, this judge now punted this matter back to the zoning board. I personally think he had sufficient grounds to uh, revoke their uh, variances, but now that it's back in the hands of the zoning board, it's an unprecedented opportunity for us to correct a what is, is in my opinion, a great wrong. I saw completely misrepresented their ability to uh, go forward with this project in obtaining their variances. They claimed they were shovel ready. They claimed they had their finances in order. Obviously, none of that turned out to be true. I, if I was the city, would have gone after them to revoke the variances on those misrepresentations alone. But for whatever reasons, the city didn't do it. Now, we subsequently, in spite of those misrepresentations by ISTAR, renewed their permits. Not once, I believe twice. This is an opportunity to wipe the slate clean and get rid of ISTAR once and for all. They're clearly not interested in the well-being of this community. They're clearly interested only in their own bottom line. I think that the uh, council needs to come out and oppose ISTAR, the, the zoning board effectively regranting ISTAR these variances. I think that we need to shut this ISTAR thing down Get the, the zoning board needs to stand up and, and do the right thing for the residents of our city and not their political bosses. Deny these guys renewal or whatever, however the terminology may be, revoke their variances, uh, revoke their variances, and let's get somebody else in there and give it. Let's give this thing a fresh start. Thank you. So just just a point with that. Um, this, this, the city council is advised to not get involved with any sort of zoning, uh, whether it's for or against a project, so that an Article 78 is not filed or the city council or the city administration is not sued. So it's very rare, if not uh, unwise, to see a council member at a zoning board meeting uh, because it is a separate body. Uh, Mr. Marcus Tinker. 
Miss Leotoza. Hi, Leotoza Lorkey. How you doing? Um, I'm very excited that we're going forward with the OEMs. We totally need that, and that's great. And the next thing would be the comprehensive plan. I know we're talking about it, so I just want to say that uh, there's a lot of people in support. We're looking forward to having that hearing here. Um, and I just want to say that I hope that you guys are going to have a lot of the experts that could actually speak to all of the issues and the things that people are talking about so that we could actually have a really awesome hearing on that and then put that to a vote. That's all I got to say. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Tozer. Ms. Catherine Richards. Hi, just state your name uh, and address for the record. Hi, Catherine Richards of Long Beach. Um, following up with Ms. what Ms. Tozer was talking about, how do we get the comprehensive plan on the agenda? What can we do as a community to spearhead this and get it moving along? Because I don't see it ever really coming up, and I think it is something that is extraordinarily important to be discussed and addressed. So instead of constantly asking when is it going on the agenda, what can we do to expedite this and get it on the agenda? So I think I think we'll see it after the budget. It would be the smartest thing. Right now we're the administration is consumed with the budget and the council will be pretty consumed with it shortly. So I think after that uh, we'll tackle the comprehensive plan. So we should expect to see it on the agenda after the budget? I would hope so. I would hope so. I, you know, I, <laughs> I can't make any guesses about that, but I hope so. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Roy Lester. Please state your name and address for the record. Roy Lester, 72 Boyd. First of all, Mr. Tagney, I think as acting city manager, it is your responsibility to teach the city council how to speak into the microphones. Nobody has a problem hearing you. Nobody. Okay? So maybe you can take that. <laughs> you do very well in that respect, as you always have. Um, basically, I'm, I'm trying to figure out this. You know, I'm looking at the uh, agenda, and I'm looking at the information that's given to the city council. And you guys are asked to vote on these things, and I don't quite understand how you – can vote on this with this little information. For example, asking for the city comptroller to transfer funds, but you have no idea of the funds, you have no idea of the amount, you have no idea how much is left over. You're asking to vote, well, there's going to be a hearing on the, the city uh, on the $2.1 million, but you don't know who that's going to, you don't know, you know, and that's probably gonna, going to come up in the hearing. But then you're also being asked uh, the $4 million on tax anticipation notes. You don't know um, how long those notes can be good for. You don't know why the money wasn't paid before. You don't know what the money's for. You, you know, under the, what you're saying, the money only goes back into the taxes for the purpose of the taxes. But we were assured, of course, that this boardwalk was completely paid for. So we can't really go, there wasn't a reason for the money to come out if we were assured it was paid for. But regardless of that, that's for another day because that was um, tabled. But do you guys get together and ask these questions? I mean, do you have any meetings? I mean, I know, you, uh, Anissa, you were talking about getting the city council together. It just doesn't seem that you guys are coming out here prepared unless you do have other meetings that – Y where you can discuss this. You, um, I, uh, Ms. Diamond, you said that there were budget uh, meetings already this year. Um, do you guys get together on this? Or how we have a caucus before each council meeting, yes. And you discuss these things? We discuss these things, yes. Okay, now my question is how do you do that under the open meetings law? Caucus, first of all, caucusing is perfectly permissible. And as that's been confirmed by the federal court decision, Almonte versus City of Long Beach, back when the caucuses used to take place in Charles Theofan's kitchen. 
So not been permissible not for a to long discuss time. public. Mr. Mr. Lester, I'm just answering your question. You're, you're asked now. I'm going to answer. Okay. Caucusing is a time-tested um, and well-established political right for pretty much any elected official, and it's been confirmed in virtually every state and federal case that you will find. Not to discuss public policies, public meetings, things that are going to be discussed in front of the public. That's not correct. And that's the Court of Appeals. That's, the that's, court not, of that's appe simply not correct, Mr. Lester. And we have a case on point that we litiga litigated here uh -huh. called Almonte versus City of Long Beach. Yes. It's a federal case. Uh-huh. And the Court of Appeals says that if it's going to be, if you're discussing, if you're getting together to discuss the public uh, matters, that it has to be an open meeting. That's not correct. That's, uh, that's exactly what they say. Now, you're deciding, Mr. Agosti, what the... First of all, it's Mr. Agostisi. Agostisi. I've been here for uh, 11 years, so... Um, that's okay. But not, uh, notwithstanding, I suggest you read the federal court decision that applies and to... And I suggest you read the Court of oh, Appeals, which... Which applies to the state because of New York. Because that Court of Appeals decision was cited in the federal court decision, Mr. Lester. Okay. I'm very well versed on this topic. I, I am too, having okay. spent many years under the open meeting law. That's why I can't understand. Now, you do have these meetings. You, you admit you have the meetings. And I just don't understand how you can have these meetings. You can discuss these things. Now, obviously, you're discussing things uh, because nobody wants to vote without knowing these things. And I understand you, you do that. And yet, the public doesn't get the opportunity to see the exact same things that you guys do. All right, my time's up. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Nora Egan. Please state your name for the record. Hey, Nora Egan. I just have three points, uh, and I know Mr. Rami has already kind of addressed it. Um, can you just like let us know where we are with the city manager interviews, how many people we've had interviewed for the position, and where we are on that? And then the second goes to the controller position. And then with regards to the comprehensive plan, you're saying it'll be after the budget, so is that after May or July, or when will that be on for a vote? I just... I just said after the budget. I don't know. That's why I wouldn't make a, a promise uh, to the previous speaker because I don't know uh, when we're going to have all the experts and everything lined up. I just know that with the budget the way it is, it's going to be very busy and complex, so it's just going to be after that. So um, the comptroller, I think he spoke to, and I'm not prepared to talk any further about the city uh, manager, um, the city manager Applicants. Applicants. We've had many. Unless any of the other council members would like to, I'm, I'm not prepared to. Anybody want to address the number of applicants we've had? The number? Nobody? I, I'll address it because this you. has come up several times. Um, it's been stated at the meeting before that we got about 50 resumes. Um, there was a, a first round of interviews, which has been completed now. Um, there will now be a second round of face-to-face -face interviews. Some of the interviews were done by phone for people that weren't local. There will now be a second round of face-to-face -face interviews, which from that should be selected a final candidate. Okay. So if I wanted to, I could FOIL for every single applicant's name, correct? Everything is on record, right? Just clarifying because it's Long Beach. Yeah? Okay. Yes. And then the other question or <coughs> statement is to address the lady, but I think she's left, uh, the lady who has lucky enough not to commute anymore, that if we would, like, recommend that the commanding officers televise, like, or videotape or live stream every single meeting, which is much better than the ones that we pay for. So maybe she could watch the commanding officers meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Pinto? Please just state your name and address for the record. Sure. Uh, Sam Pinto. I'm um, representing Long Beach Firefighters, Local 287. Um, quick, uh, just to touch on last meeting. A uh, concerned resident came up, asked some significant questions. It appeared that the council didn't really have that much information before them. 
Um, so I'm going to touch on a few of those points on behalf of the union. Uh, the first question she asked was about overtime. She heard a rumor overtime is out of control. Uh, I just want to clarify on that. It is not under control, uh, out of control, I'm sorry. Um, it is totally in control. Uh, actually, it's going directly by plan for the city. Um, a few years ago, the city restructured the fire department, uh, hired paramedics to do uh, primary EMS, and uh, chose to, to decrease the amount of cross-trained firefighters. Uh, this was the management's prerogative, and we currently are maintaining 17 firefighters on the books, down from 33, and uh, 17 positions for them to fill. So we are literally at exact number, bare minimum. Uh, the city has decided to pay overtime instead of hiring more firefighters at lower cost uh, to fill these vacancies. So it's by the city's design um, for where we are, are right now. Uh, the commissioner also brought up a Supreme Court lawsuit. Um, this lawsuit, the union retracted and came into an agreement with the city. We settled, both sides compromised and agreed to maintain a safe four-man cross-trained fire engine at all times. Uh, we were able to utilize FLSA exemptions, uh, able to work vacancies instead of being on overtime. We can work at a straight time, which is the benefits of being a firefighter. Um, we also agreed to adding a secondary control measure uh, with an overtime cap, and this has been very effective. Uh, frustratingly, the union now believes that there was a, 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 a challenge to our good faith settlement that we are having to now address with um, by a recent order by the commissioner. Um, the second point was a test. She asked, why don't we hire more, put a test out for four, more firefighters? Um, the city said it wasn't their plan to do so. Um, as I said before, we are working with a lim limited staff in regards to a hiring exam. It was brought up that there is a preferred list. Yes, there is a preferred list of four members that were laid off in 2015. Uh, it's set for final expiration in February, upcoming, and as to our understanding, every firefighter who was laid off already has new employment. With that being said, that's a very low probability that they would come back, and we have been told that you can apply for an exam while having a preferred list gaining priority. Uh, exams are normally offered in May, and with uh, out an exam coming out this year, there will be a void and an eligible list come February 2019. Uh, in regards to cost, I think someone in the city said that they cost a lot of money. Uh, civil service exams historically have been money makers for the administrations. Uh, they take the revenues from the test fees to offset the hosting and the examination costs. Um, with that being considered, we have also been told finally after that uh, conversation that the city is not planning on hiring a test. Uh, it's the city's choice to do so. It's the choice of the city to hire the ICMA when they were validating their restructuring. And it's their choice to pay overtime instead of hiring newer low-cost firefighters. Um, a third point is ambulance response times. They were asked. Uh, real quick, the response times have always been good. They have never been a question of they were good or not. They were always above the national standard. Uh, your ICMA report did confirm that. Um, and last beyond that, um, the ambulance that the city is using right now for a second ambulance by South Nassau, they're actually being subcontracted by a for-profit company called Senior Care who does interfacility transports. Okay. Um, so just so you know, they are not readily available like it appears as they are often giving priority to interfacility transportation compared to being available for the residents. Um, does the council have any other questions, maybe, uh, about some of the topics I brought up? Yeah, I, I have a question for you. Um, out of the 17 remaining paid firefighters, um, are any of them near retirement? Yes. I would say more than half of them. There's no one. Un there's two guys under 40 still on the job. Uh, four or five of them are eligible for retirement this or next year, and the rest of them are within three or four years of retirement eligibility. So what is the city's plan to replace them? What is the city's plan to replace firefighters as they retire? Listen, uh, you know, we address that problem as, as it arises. That we do have a preferred list right now. Uh, we believe that some of these firefighters would be interested in working five seconds from home again. If, if offered. No one heard you, Brock. No one heard you. Okay. Well, as we mentioned last time, there is a preferred list, and right now we are for whatever vacancies that might arise. And by the way, we've been advised of no impending vacancies at all. Um, but when and if that need occur, that need occurs, we will assess it at that time. But right now, we are. So, so what would be the process if the four preferred are, let's say, a position opens are offered, but let's say they decline it because they already have other employment? What would then be the process to fill an open slot? The process would be to figure out if we have the financial wherewithal to fill an open slot. That would be the first step. But, 
but it, so, so we're talking about if we're at minimum staffing level now and we lose a firefighter for whatever reason or firefighters, we have no plan to replace those, fi those firefighters so the gap would be filled with the volunteers? No, the gap would be filled from the preferred list. We'd go through the preferred list first. All right, you're, you're missing my point. What I'm no, saying I is I if, fully the preferred point, if the preferred, since they're already employed, if those people turned it down, what is the alternative plan to fill vacancies if the preferred list does not pan out? Can, can I just add on to the, his question? Correct me if I'm wrong, but if, there's, if there is a vacancy d under the minimum staffing, we would have to, until we replace the person, we would have to backfill them on overtime, correct? Uh, well, it's hard, to, it's hard to assess that right now. That, that's a decent possibility. Yes. That is a possibility. But also, remember, there are other mechanisms to bring in, to bring in personnel besides um, having a list. You can bring in temporary empl employees under civil service law, and there are a host of other mechanisms. So, so would it be an accurate statement to say there is currently no plan beyond the preferred list to fill fire, fire, firefighter positions? That, I couldn't answer that question. I'm not the listen, I'm not the department head. Can I, can I, I just ask? I, I may not have access to all that information. I know my time is up, but I just have a question, only because it came up before. Last time we were here, there was a th talk of 1,000 people on the list for the police department, correct? I, I think that may have come right, up, Right, yes. so just, just do the math. 1,000 people passed the exam, probably double took it. That's $100,000 if you're given a $100 application fee plus, just on passing it. So there's, there's financial benefit for hosting exams historically. I understand. No, that, that's not true. Uh, the state collects the majority of that money. We uh, get enough to uh, get the exam, but we don't keep the whole hundred dollars once it goes past certain numbers. I was under that misunderstanding myself. Okay. Okay. Time's up. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Pinto. <laughs> Ms. Volosevich. Please state your name for the record. Bill and Mary Volosevich, Long Beach. Um, um, I have a question that I've been asked. Um, who are, are the confessioners this year? I heard some are not coming back upon the boardwalk. I think there was a change. I, I don't know. I, I think there was a change. Was in there one a of the bid ownerships? that went out for the ones not coming back? Well, they're all in the contract. They're all under five, of, I think, five-year contracts. Oh, so they're all going to open? Yes. Oh. As far as, okay. as far as we know, as far as I know, as far as I know. Oh, okay. Well, that's not what's out there. Um, and the a other if thing If one of the businesses decides not to open, then that's, you know, that's on, on them, but they all have contracts. Um, and we the did other put thing is... Mary, we did put out a, a bid, and we did get some responses because we were looking to expand it. So the bid was more for the expansion than replacing existing. That's for the food trucks. Yeah. Oh, oh you're just talking about the, the that's for food. That's for food trucks, what he's talking about. You're for talking what? about the boardwalk concessions. On the concession oh. up yeah. there. Yeah. Okay. And the other big thing um, that has everybody concerned, and you don't want to talk about it, I'm sure, is how financially in debt we are and how, how do you plan on getting out of it? You don't want to talk about it now, okay? But everybody out there is talking about it, whether you want to believe it or not. And if you're looking between 20 and 25 percent with new um, uh, tax assessments on the homes that were raised, some people have gone up to 13, 14,000. You want to add another 20, 25,000. Why don't you just put the bridges up and let everybody leave? Because you people are out of your minds, and you knew this for a very long time. Everybody knew this. Because we, the laymen, we all knew it was coming, but we were told, no, 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 no. We have this and we have that. And he should be ashamed of himself in Nassau County. <laughs> Mr. Michael Duray. Deloy, sorry. Delory. Oh, it's Mike. <laughs> sorry about that, Mr. Delory. 
<laughs> and my wife, she's an O'Neill when you get married. Don't worry about it. They're misspelling. I'm mispronouncing it all the time. Um, I just have a couple of questions. I don't know if I could a ask them tonight because some items were tabled. Um, Commissioner, thank you for being here tonight. I know you're not feeling well. Um, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong. When you have a federal project relating to the boardwalk, it's my understanding, and I could be absolutely wrong, that it was completed, the, the costs and the expenses were submitted, and you get reimbursed probably within a year of somebody signing off and verifying that that project is complete per the design spec. Is this cost related to the tax day anticipation note just to get reimbursed for items that came up after the fact? So it's a timing issue. My understanding was the boardwalk is completed. What other expenses, or are they, are they future expenses? Are these walkovers planned? Are they, I don't think they have to do with the bathrooms. So I, I just need a little understanding of that. If tonight's not the appropriate time, perhaps in two weeks we could have an answer on that. I believe it was multiple projects that are already completed. About how many projects? These these are seven. There's seven projects total that these uh, that we've completed the paperwork on and submitted for projects that are complete. Sometimes what we do is the project may appear completely completed, like the boardwalk, but there's still things going on on the boardwalk until we know it's completely done. We don't want to close the project out. As an example, the bathrooms, the original money on the bathrooms. We had five bathrooms done. We were at the end of the of the project of the allotment. We didn't close it out, and we were able to negotiate another $1.7 million to finish the rest of the bathroom. So we're very careful about closing out projects. But these are seven projects that are completed now. All the paperwork is in. Closed out. Closed out. There's nothing else that, that we can do here. We're sure that there's not going to be any more money needed for the rest of this project. So that's why we've closed them out. And that's what we look at. We try not to close something out that may still need some work on it. So. Okay. One of the things I, I guess I'd like some clarity on is um, what we're waiting for basically is revenue reimbursement from the state, which would be... Well, actually, it's 90% reimbursement from FEMA and 10% reimbursement well, from right. the state. I'm, I'm sorry, but um, I, I guess where I'm getting, uh, I have a question is why would this then not be a revenue anticipation note rather than a tax anticipation again, note? Again, again, that's a decision that the controller would make and would be advised by consultants on this. I'm not an area that I get involved in. I just do the, the work in terms of what the projects cost and when they're closed out. We did go to bond council on this, and they, this is what we were advised to do. Any idea why this route? It just seems a little... My understanding is that my understanding is that we've um, exhausted our ability to, to take out another RAM, and that's why we have to take out the TAM. Simply, it's, it's and that's how I knew yeah. it was a RAM. Is three years. So we, we can't borrow anymore, as far as RAM is concerned. As far as the RAM on this particular item. It's my understanding it's not general borrowing on a RAN. We already took out a RAN to pay for this project. This is now the TAN to pay the RAN. It's the TAN to pay the RAN because we've been waiting so long for this funding to come back. We do have the ability to borrow, as I'm, is my understanding. And we had to lay out all the money for the project to bill to get it back in. So we've av actually been using our operating uh, general fund to fund these projects, and that's why we need this money to float payroll and such. So that, well, let me bring that up then. So you said the, the float payroll, but before it was said this was solely for reimbursing the cost. So if, if there's a shortfall for payroll, then this has got an additional function other than reimbursing for. No, it, it's, you're, con you're mixing two different items. The shortfall is um, 
to, to get this job done, and the, the payroll issue is separate and distinct. We have $4 million right now sitting in the bank to be paid in June. We can't use that for anything. So now we spent $4 million from the general fund and stuff to do all this that we have to get reimbursed for. So we need to take a note right now to get us through so that when we do get reimbursed, we can pay everything back and stay solvent. Okay, that's it for this. 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 Okay, that's it for this.